well, first, thank you everybody for attending uh, our talk today called Deep Dive into uh, an ICS Firewall. But before we start, uh, let us introduce ourselves. So I'm uh, Julien Lenoir. I'm a member of the security evaluation team of Airbus, where I do evaluate both uh, IT, uh, IT systems and embedded systems. And I do mostly uh, reverse engineering and vulnerability research. And I also have to admit that uh, Linux is my, my kryptonite. Um, hello everyone, I'm Benoit Corodon, and I'm also a security evaluator in working in the same team as Julian. I mainly, uh, my day-to-day -day job is to mainly perform um, embedded system audits and pen tests, and my main interest is um, everything that is related to Linux and the network. And uh, for the guys in the back of the room, I'm not small, it's just very tall. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, Benoit and I um, are not really ICS, uh, ICS specialists, but, but uh, rather evaluation specialists. So today the, the purpose of this talk is to share with you the results we have along with the, the methodology we used. So this presentation will be about the evaluation of a, a firewall which is dedicated to protect uh, industrial systems and it's called the Toffin Oxenon. It, it, well, it's, uh, it's manufactured by, uh, by, by Belden. So all the vulnerabilities you'll see today were responsibly disclosed to the vendor who has issued the firmware in November 2017 to fix the vulnerabilities. And three of those vulnerabilities were assigned CVs and we'll detail them uh, uh, later in this presentation. So today's presentation I, uh, outline will be the following. So first we'll describe the threats and constraints of the, the ICS environments. Then we'll present the Toffin Oxenon, the firewall we have evaluated. Then the evalu evaluation objectives we had, the, the, the guidelines we followed, and the met also the methodology we followed. Then the preliminary work we had to achieve to get to the internals of the equipment to, to conduct the uh, evaluation in the proper conditions. Then the evaluation results, results, and finally we'll conclude. Okay, so first, what do we mean by ICS systems? So we say that that's everything that is, is controlling industrial processes. So there are many kinds of industrial control systems. Uh, they are categorized by the Purdue model in a, in a <laughs> in three different categories for three different levels, from level three to level zero, where the closer you are, the lower the level is, the closer you are from the industrial process. So what's important for you to, to keep in mind here is that the, the file we have evaluated is meant to be deployed between level two equipments, like uh, HMIs or SCADA, and level one equipments like PLCs. So first, a few, few figures regarding the vulnerabilities which were uh, identified in 2017, figures from uh, Kaspersky Lab ICS cert. So we can see that uh, 322 vulnerabilities were, were identified and we identified and we, and roughly 60% of them had the CVSS score higher than 60%, which means that there were quite severe vulnerabilities. Uh, we can also see that um, the, the sectors affect, affected are, um, are crucial for our day-to-day -day lives, which makes, makes this topic very, uh, very concerning. When what's also concerning is that those systems tend to be more and more connected to the, uh, to the outside world. So one, one of the main constraints of the ICS systems is av availability, and there's a very good reason for that. First, because uh, uh, malfunctions of those systems can have uh, significant impacts for people working uh, in, in the fields there, but also that the downtime, downtime costs of, the, of those systems are very, very, very high. So here we are facing some kind of dilemma because on one hand you have some, some systems who are running which are vulnerable, sometimes they are quite old and, and uh, fixes are not available and even when they are, you have very rare occasions to stop the system and to apply the patches. And on the other hand, there are threat, the, the, those systems face threats and, uh, and real world attacks do happen and we saw them uh, in, the, in the Triton talk this morning, which was a, a good talk, uh, by the way. So to, 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 to answer this dilemma and this, this, um, 
this business need, dedicated systems have, have come to the market, which are meant to be to be deployed in front of vulnerable uh, ICS systems, and they are meant to stop the attack by filtering network packets and to, to ensure that, uh, that, that, that only valid packets reach potential, potentially vulnerable equipments to, 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 to protect them, and invalid packets are meant to be dropped. Oops. So our objective, we have we the we had two objectives here. The first one is kind of obvious. It's uh, it's you, we wanted to answer the question: How effective are this this uh, this equipment to protect the, 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 the ICS systems? And the other one is: Is there is there any vulnerability inside the firewall itself that may be introduced in the network by deploying it? So we had a few constraints. The first one, which is the, the, the very important one, is that we were not allowed to physically tamper with the equipment, which means we were not able to open it and unsolder the flash, for example. So we were limited to, uh, to software-only attacks. And uh, we had, uh, uh, I would not say limited, but we have a, a few inputs, which were firmware updates available on the, from the vendor website the user guides, and of course the appliance itself to, to play with it. So our approach was the following. We first, we first listed all the features that the, the equipment has. Then we took in consideration the French Network and Information Security Agency security profile for this kind of ICS firewalls, and we'll detail them later. And finally, we, uh, from, with these profiles, we, we kept uh, all the most relevant and the, the most relevant features, and, those, and the, we had the list of those who, which had to be evaluated, and then we evaluated them the offensive way. Okay, so now we are going to present the Tofino Xenon system from a final, from a final user point of view. So it is a firewall, so it has to be located in front of your ICS, of your network of ICS. It will physically segregate um, the open world that is represented by the, um, by the control network, that's where the attack comes from, and the secure zone that is containing your ICS systems. But from a logical point of view, it is free transparent and has not even an IP address, meaning that if you buy a Tofino Xenon system, you do not have to change your network configuration, you do not have to change your network addressing. It has been designed to be fully plug and play and to have the least possible impact on your existing system. Now the filtering is done at two different levels. Uh, a first classic one, which is based on network parameters like protocol, port, um, destination source, and a more ICS-oriented one, where the Tofino system will deeply inspect the content of the application layer of the ICS packets, and according to the, the content, it will allow or not the packets to go through the firewall. There are three different protocols that are handled by the Tofino appliance, the Modbus TCP protocol, the Ethernet IP, and the OPC Classic. As Julian said previously, um, a very important thing in ICS environment is uh, the availability. And for that, Tofino developed two different modes for the appliance. The first one is a test mode, where packets that should have been dropped are only logged and not really dropped. And once you are in line with your configuration, you can switch to an operational mode where the packet will be really dropped if they do not match a firewall, a firewall rule. Now I'm going to describe the two main components of the Tofino. The first one is a security appliance, the small box that you will install in your uh, network. So it has been physically designed to fit in a safety critical environment. And the box has two uh, Ethernet ports, one for the open zone and one for the secure zone connected to your ICS systems. There is also a USB uh, port that is used to push filtering configuration, to push new upgrades, or to retrieve some log of the appliance.
Now, there is also the configurator, which is the software part. It's the only official way to configure one or more appliance. Uh, it's a Windows rich client, and it allows to uh, define the filtering rules to customize the DPI level of for ICS protocols. And once you are uh, in line with the configuration, you have two different ways to apply this configuration. The first one is using the net a network protocol that, is, that has been customized by Tofino and that we will describe in a few slides. And the other way is to generate an encrypted file that you can store in a USB stick. So now uh, a bit more about the evolution objectives, the guidelines we... Uh, we followed. So in those guidelines, they make a few assumptions. The first uh, regarding the ICS uh, firewall equipment. The first one is regarding its locations. So they consider it's not necessarily stored in a location where there is a strict control access, which means that uh, an attacker may have physical access to the equipment for a few minutes. Also regarding the dimensioning of the equipment, which means that it's, uh, it's properly dimensioned for its task. In other, in other words, that uh, floating attacks are not relevant. And also that uh, an attacker can purchase the equipment to search for vulnerabilities prior to launching the attack. And with this regard, what Benoit and I did during this evaluation is very representative of this kind of attacker profiles. So as I said, the attacker can, can have an access for a few minutes to the equipment, but it's, it, it, it's considered that it cannot open, open, the, open the box and, and, and perform physical attacks on the equipment. So the security objectives, we summed up the, the, all the security objectives that are described in the guidelines, and we kept those are very relevant for our equipment. So the first most important security objective, I would say, is the firewall security objective. So first policy of enforcement, like what's the basic firewall functions, and also protocol conformity analysis, which is the packet inspection. Also the administration, because we consider that they, it may it must have a secure authentication and also proper access control to the equipment on both USB and network in our case. And also on the upgrade, because we consider that the, 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 the upgrades must be, the firmware must be properly signed on both, uh, here once again, on both USB and network firmware, because both can, can, uh, can be uploaded both ways. So now the, the preliminary work we had to achieve to get to the internals of the equipment. The way Benoit and I work we, is uh, the following. We usually like to have access to the code of the equipment, either the source code when it's available or the binary code of the, the firmware to do reverse engineering. So we tried this, this approach, but unfortunately for us, the, the firmware are fully encrypted and the decryption keys are stored inside the appliance. And the, this appliance is, was kind of a, of a black box. So, and as I said, we were not able to unsold, unsolder the flash to extract the, the, the decryption keys, so this, the, this way was, was a dead end. So we looked at the way the, the, the USB configuration is applied, but as Benoit said previously, it's also uh, un encrypted, and the decryption keys are also stored inside the appliance, so this was a dead end too. So the, the, the last way of doing for us was, uh, was, was with the custom protocol that, that, uh, that the configurator use, uses to, to, to configure the appliance. So what we did, we reverse engineer the configurator to understand the packet format and the crypto scheme that is used uh, to, uh, to, to authenticate and to, con to, to, to administrate the, the security appliances. That, that's what I'm showing you right now. So as Benoit said, uh, the appliance doesn't even have an IP address. So there must be a way for the configurator to know how, where is located the appliance inside the network. So basically what's the, and that's the purpose of the discovery protocol. So what the Tofino, Tofino did is that the, the configurator is, is sending a piece of data here to, uh, to ICS systems, and as the appliance is standing somewhere in between the ICS systems and the configurator, it will receive the, see the packet coming. It will intercept this packet. This packet contains, contains a piece of data encrypted with a key, 
KH, where H stands for hardcoded, and this key is, is hardcoded in both the appliance and the configurator. So the appliance receives this packet, decrypts the data, and if the, the data inside this packet is meaningful, it means that the appliance knows, knows it's being discovered and answered, acknowledges the dif discovery packet. Then the configurator knows the appliance is st standing somewhere here on, the, on this network pass, so it's now sending an authentication packet with another piece of data encrypted with uh, two other keys, K2 and K3. Those keys are not hardcoded, but shared between the appliance and the configurator. So when the appliance receives this packet and manages to decrypt the packets, it's, it knows it's sharing K2 and K3 with the configurator. This way it authenticates the configurator. And so it opens an, an SSH port for the, for the configurator to connect to it. So what we did basically for first, we reversed in general the, 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 the protocol to, to, to understand that. And we also implemented our own version of the client in Python. We extracted the default keys, K2, K3, and also the, the SSH key. To, uh, to implement our own client in Python, and we are able to open and uh, to, to connect to the appliance with uh, over SSH. So we, we got an SS, uh, a root shell because on the on the on the appliance everything is uh, is running running uh, as root. It's uh, unfortunately it's, it's still quite common on the embedded systems. So this was a major step forward for us because from now on the appliance was not anymore. A black box. So we understood that it was a, a Linux operating system running on top of a PowerPC architecture, and we had access to the whole file system content, the, uh, the internal configuration, the AP table rules, and we were also uh, able to do live debugging to understand how the, how the appliance works. So now we are moving to the evaluation part, where we will part, where we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we've evaluated all the all the features and to see if the the evaluation the security objectives are met or not. Okay. So now the when you have you first install a Tofino appliance on your network, you can use any configurator in order to connect and configure it, because by default. Or every appliance are sharing the same default keys. So the first thing that you, you will want to do is to restrict this access to your configurator and not the other ones. This phase is called the association phase. It consists in generating new keys on the configurator and send them to the appliance. Once this association phase is done, you are the only configurator that is able to connect to the appliance because the knowledge of K2 and K3 is mandatory in order to do the authentication part of the protocol. However, your appliance can still be discovered by other configurator because the discovery part is using the KH key, which is not changed during the association phase. So we have audited the code that is doing this custom protocol and we didn't find any vulnerability. So for us, uh, it means that the network authentication objective of the Tofino is met. Now, now, what about the Tofino upgrade mechanism? It can be done using two different ways. The first is to use the configurator and the network protocol. It is well designed and well implemented. And the other one is using a USB stick. A USB update is in fact a zip archive containing two different files. The first is an update script, and the second one is a data file um, containing a Linux kernel and a file system. Both files are encrypted using the, the AES algorithm, and the key used for encryption is shared among every appliance. But at the very beginning, we didn't know this key, so we were not able to decrypt the firmware. But once we get the shell, the, the, the shell, uh, shell access on the appliance, we were able to extract, to extract this key and then to decrypt the firmware. But the major issue here is that only the update script is signed and the data file is not signed, meaning that if you modify the data file, the Tofino system has no way to know that a an unauthorized modification has been applied. So, when you first plug your USB stick in order to upgrade the Tofino, it decrypts and checks the signature of the scripts, 
and if it is correct, it executes the script. The script then decrypts the data file and writes the Linux kernel and the file system into the Tofino flash memory. So an attacker can connect to the Tofino website, retrieve a valid firmware, decrypt the data file because it has access to the keys that is shared among every appliance, change the content, for example, to backdoor the Linux kernel, to change some binaries in the file system or whatever, re-encrypt re the file and then store it in the USB key and um, plug it into the Tofino. The Tofino won't have any way to know that this firmware has been modified. So, if you are an attacker and if you have a physical access to the appliance, it's game over. If you are able to plug a USB stick into the appliance, it's, it's game over. The impact of the appliance is a full compromise. And so, our security objective about the firmware signature is not met because the data file is not signed. So this bug was reported to the vendor and a CVE has been assigned and it was patched in the latest firmware. Now we are going to describe the firewall internals of the Tofino appliance. So because the underlying operating system is Linux, without any surprise, the filtering is done using NetFilter. NetFilter will do the filtering using network parameters, but it is also responsible for forwarding packets, for forwarding ICS packets to three user land modules, one for each protocol that is handled by the Tofino appliance. Those modules have the responsibility to pass, analyze, and according to some rules that we will describe later, to say if the packet is allowed or not to go through the firewall. Okay, so now I'm going to describe a quite tricky bug that we will use in our final, final attack. But first I need to detail what is happening when an administrator wants to enforce the DPI filtering while there is already established ICS communications. Let's take an example. You are an administrator, you have installed a Tofino appliance on your network, it is in test mode, you are in line with this configuration, the logs are saying that everything is okay, so you want to switch to operational mode to really drop bad packets. But at the same time, in your company, you have an HMI that is communicating with a PLC. When the PLC will send its response, and when the administrator will push the button in order to really filter the packets, the PLC response may be dropped because it is not yet related to a tracked connection. And in an ICS environment, availability is crucial and it must not happen. So, to avoid this problem, Tofino developed a workaround that allow for 30 seconds when a configuration has just been applied, they allow every ICS response. And for that, they implement a custom kernel module, a custom net filter module that is adding a kind of time to leave uh, parameters to firewall rules. And th those rules that we have called timed rules, when they are applied, a timer is started and they match packets only if the timer has not, have not expired. So if we come back to our case, when the PLC will send its response, the packet will be allowed, not because it is related to a tracked connection, but because it is in the 30 second time frame. It's a compromise between availability and security. But because it's a compromise, it means that for an attacker, it's a window opportunity for 30 seconds to bypass the firewall, to bypass the classic firewall. So the impact is high because you have 30 seconds just after applying a configuration to bypass the classic filtering, but the impact is quite low because it only happens when there is a, a, a new configuration. However, even if you can bypass the classic filtering, 
the deep packet inspection still applied on your packets. Keep in mind this problem because we will use it in a few slides. Okay, so Benoit showed you the path of the network packet through uh, IP table rules to DPI modules for filtering. So now we will talk about what those DPL modules are doing because that's the, the real added value of those equipments and that's the core of their technology. So they are doing uh, deep packet inspection at two levels. The first one is at packet format. So basically what they are doing is that they are ensuring that the packets we are meant to go through the firewall respect the specifications and they are well formed. Uh, if they are not, they will be dropped to avo avoid any passing error on, 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 on ICS equipment and triggering uh, any vulnerability. That's the first level. The second level is, is content filtering. Modbus and Ethernet IP have a master-slave model when you where the master sends commands and expect, expect response. And those commands are uh, actions you want to perform on the target equipments like reading memory, writing memory, programming, and things like that. So the, the, the firewall has the ability to, to restrict uh, the set of commands that are allowed inside the packet even though the, the, the packet format is correct. So now I will show uh, two examples of this, uh, this filtering. So the first one is the, uh, the, the, the packet format filtering. It's an example, an extract from the, the Modbus specification. And that's just an example. So the function code number one is, uh, is a command to read data from, from, uh, from, uh, from the equipment. So there are one byte for, for the command, two bytes for the address where, where we want to, to read from, and two, but two, two bytes for the quantity one of the data that we want to read. So the, the DPI module is basically uh, add the, the address and the quantity to check if there is an, over, an overflow. And it will also answer, ensure that the, the, the quantity is below the maximum authorized by the specification. So just an example, there are many, many, many of, of those kind of, of checks in, in the modules. The other one here is that the, the, the content filtering, that's the, the restriction on the allowed comments. So from the Tofino configurator, Benoit has talked to you about a few slides ago, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you, you have an interface when you can apply predefined profiles to say I want to restrict to read only comments, read write, etc. And you also have an advanced menu when you can cherry pick which, which comments you want to, uh, to, to allow or not. So now I will uh, describe all of the filters, the three filters we have audited, starting with Ethernet IP. So this is only on one slide, it will be very quick. We had to make decisions regarding the time we had. Uh, so Ethernet IP protocol is running on top of, uh, of TCP or UDP and it's con conveying con uh, control industrial protocol of CIP messages. So we found a bug here, but uh, unfortunately for us, uh, as an attacker, it's only on the Re, re, on replies, meaning from, from slave to masters, because from slave to masters, the, 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 the modules are also uh, doing a uh, deep packet inspection. So it fa in fact, it was an out of bound write inside in the, in the DPI when it's parsing the packets, but we, we were not, were not able to, uh, to, to use it for code execution, execution or memory corruption inside the, inside the, 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 the filter's memory. Uh, we just used it to bypass the sanity checks, the, 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 the packet sanity verification that are, that are done on, on the reply messages. So this was reported and patched by the vendor, and, but we didn't ask for a CV, ECV number on this one. So just for you to know that we also uh, audited this, this, uh, this module. Now we're moving to the Modbus filter, which is uh, the results are slightly more interesting. So the, the Modbus, uh, Commands or function codes are conveyed inside the application data units. Uh, you have an example here on the screen. So it's composed of a header and also a protocol data unit which contains the function code you, you're sending to the equipment along with the data and the format of the data depends of the function code you're sending. What's interesting to notice here is that the length of the protocol data unit is stored inside the header. So the first thing we noticed is that um, the, the, the Tofino allows packets that contain multiple application data units inside the network frame, even though this is not explic explicitly defined inside the Modbus standard. And it's really, really interesting. 
So what's the mode the, the filter is doing for each data the application data unit? So it, it, check, it will check whether the function code is authorized regarding the, the profiles that are applied, and also that the sanity check are correct. Though all the sanity checks on the the first will ensure that the application data unit length is uh, is is in, in below the uh, above the minimum and uh, below the maximum authorized by the by the specification seven and uh, twenty forty eight bytes, and they will also uh, also do sanity check on the, dat da uh, the the data that are specific to the function code. But they they missed here a very important thing: they didn't check that the length stored inside the header is below the maximum authorized by the standards, the twenty forty eight bytes, and that's very important. So now let's see what's happening when the when the when the, the filter is is validating a packet which contains multi, multiple data units. So it will first it's it's done in the loop. You have the, the pseudocode of the of the loop implemented inside the filter here. So the filter is first checking that the the, the first application data unit is correct. If it's correct, it will use the lens stored inside the header to compute the offset of the next data unit, and then it will do the check again on the next one, and it will do it in a loop, and at the end of the loop, if all the data units are correct, the frame is considered valid and can go through the firewall. But what happens in case of an invalid lens is conveyed inside the first uh, application data unit header. So the first data unit, data unit is checked, so it has to be correct to go through the firewall. Then it will, uh, the, the filter will use the incorrect uh, lens from the header to compute the offset. And the funny thing here is that it will see that something is going wrong. So it will exit the loop. And at the end of the loop, it will uh, do another check. And here is uh, there is a logical issue because if, if even if the if, even if the size is incorrect, it returns frame valid instead of frame invalid, which means that will will stop the verification and will allow the frame to go through the firewall. And that's uh, that's that's a major issue, but still we have to 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 have the first application data unit that is correct. And for that, we we in our test we chose the function code number seven here because it's a it's a one one only one byte PDU and it's in all predefined. Um, uh, pre predefined list of, of allow, all, allowed comments. So we and, and as we can see on this packet here, if, if the first data unit is correct, uh, with the, the, the packet containing arbitrary data can be can be can go through the firewall. So that's uh, that's uh, as I said a major issue because it's uh, it's kind of. Uh, a universal bypass of the mode bus filter because this way we send we send the packet which contains an invalid length and also arbitrary data across the firewall, and it can have an important impact of the ICS system. And it's exactly the kind of thing the the, the firewall is, is is meant to protect 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 us against. So the security objective of the mode bus filters regarding conformity uh, analysis objective is is not meant. And this 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 bug was assigned the CVE and was uh, was was reported to to the to the vendor. Okay, now we are going to describe the OPC classic filter, which is filtering OPC protocol. This protocol is based is based on Microsoft Com Decom technology and has the specificity to use multiple TCP connection using dynamic ports. If you have a look on the diagram below, so when the client open a TCP connection on the static port 135, after a while the server will ask the client to use a new TCP connection. And this uh, new TCP connection will be done on a port that is inside the application layer of the packet. So when the client receives this packet, it opens th this new connection. But of course, this new TCP connection has to be allowed by the firewall, and you can't guess the dynamic TCP port, so it is the responsibility of the OPC filtering to pass this kind of packet and to dynamically add uh, this rule to allow the new TCP connection. It's exactly uh, what is done on uh, FTP with the FTP data um, connection. But there is a bug. When the OPC filter is passing the packet, it, it is uh, not checking the state machine, meaning that if you are the client, you send a request, and you can't 
send a response to your request. The OPC filtering is not checking if the response is coming from the PLC. So you can send the request and the response. And the, um, the consequence will be that a new filtering rule will be added allowing a connection from the PLC to the attacker, which is not the most interesting for an attacker. So the impact is quite low, but what is important is that you can, as an attacker, dynamically add a rule whenever you want, and it will have some very interesting impact in, in the following slides. Another vulnerability that we have found on the OPC filter is the way that the filter is handling a small packets. A OPC header is, um, is composed of 19 bytes, and if the filter received a packet smaller than 19 bytes, it, is consider, it considers th this packet as invalid because too small. But there is a logical flow, as you can see on the right side of the slide uh, in the pseudocode. The return value is set to one, and the parsing is done only if the, uh, the size is greater than 19. And if it is not the case, the packet is not parsed, but the return value is not changed. You are never going to the else branch. So this invalid packet will be allowed to go through the firewall. And unfortunately, OPC protocol is on top of TCP, meaning that you can use TCP fragmentation. You can take a big bad packet, split it in very small packets, send every small packet to your target. The OPC filtering will allow all these small packets to go through. And when the target will receive all these small packets, it will reassemble everything to get the bit bad packet. So using TCP fragmentation, you are able to fully bypass the deep packet inspection of OPC protocol. And so the OPC protocol conformity is not met because of this flow. Now we have seen many low impact or low potentiality bugs, we will try to put it together in order, in order to get a higher impact on the firewall. But first, I will just do a brief summary of findings that we will combine. The first one is the time rule vulnerabilities that allow you to bypass the classic filtering for 30 seconds, but only when a configuration is applied. The other one is the capability for an attacker to dynamically add a firewall rule. And the last one is the one that, that I've just described, is the capability to bypass OPC deep packet inspection by using TCP fragmentation. In addition to this bug, the Tofino developer were not aware of a very specific net filter behavior. When you add a rule in NetFilter, this rule is added to a set of existing rules. Meaning that if you add a rule, every rule will be applied again, including timed rule. And when a timed rule is applied, the timer is reset. So the potentiality of the time rule vulnerability was low, but in fact, because of this very specific net filter behavior, it happens if every time you add a rule, so whenever the attacker wants. But there is still the deep packet inspection, inspection that is done on this, on this packet, but you can bypass it using TCP fragmentation. So in this slide, I will describe the different steps in order to run a complete attack for bypassing the filtering of the Tofino firewall. We use a, tel um, a Linux target with an open telnet service. This telnet service was not allowed by the firewall. The only thing that was allowed between the attacker and the target was the OPC uh, protocol. So you first have to open an OPC connection on a static port 135, then send a request and a response to your target telling, telling the target that you want to use a new TCP connection on a new dynamic port. When the OPC filtering will pass this packet, it will add the rule, 
and the consequence will be that every rule will be applied again, including time rules, so the timer will be reset. So you have a 30 seconds opportunity to bypass the classic filtering and to open a, a TCP connection on your telnet service using a source port matching the OPC service just to be interpreted as an, an ICS response. And finally, send fragmented data to use the, the telnet service. In conclusion, if OPC filter is enabled between two devices, the wall filtering, the wall Tofino filtering can be bypassed. This was patched in the latest firmware version and a CV has been assigned to this bug. Okay, so we've been through all the, the security objectives of the equipment, so it's now time for us to conclude regarding this evaluation. So what we can say that uh, before trusting any security products, uh, we have to perform a deep evaluation of, of the products and, uh, and following a known and recognized referential or guidelines uh, is a very good idea. For example, Benoit and I were not uh, ICS specialists, but uh, following this, this INSSI uh, guidelines helped us a lot. What we can say regarding the Tofino case, so they are uh, good points. They're, they use open source and reliable components. Their design is quite modular, which means that when you have a vulnerability inside a, uh, a, a DPI filter, you can patch it quite easily without uh, costly modification to your software architecture. That the, most of the vulnerabilities are, uh, are, are, are implement, Im, implementation issues that the Modbus bug here is a very good example of that because instead of returning, if, if they patch the return one by return zero, the, the, the bug is not present anymore. And what's also very interesting is that the very good re reaction uh, of the vendor regarding uh, responsible disclosure because we had the very constructive dialogue with them. They, uh, they were very responsive. They did not try to minor the impact of the bugs and they were very, 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 very good. There is still room for improvement though because uh, as we, we, we've seen that uh, everything is running root I, and I think it's still the case so it, it, there, is a, there is still lack of hardening of the, uh, of the, of, on the operating system. So now we've done the, the evaluation so the, we know the, the limitations of the products and we, uh, we, 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 could, we could deploy it uh, safely after applying the patches. But if we take another step back and, and think about what are, could, could be the takeaways of this presentation. So the first one is that uh, architecture, de safe, de safe design, risk analysis, and, and those, the, those things are very are crucial because without those, you will never end up having a, a secure product. But still, you, you do have to check the implementation because minor bugs can bring your security down. And that's things that Benoit and I see every day in our internal evaluations. And the, 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 the good way for, uh, for checking this implementation is doing a deep evaluation of the products, which, which means you, we have to spend time on it because that's the only way for, for evaluators like us to, to find the tricky bug. And I, I'm thinking about the, the time, rule, uh, time rule vulnerability and the, the custom kernel model. This one was really tricky. And finally, I have to say that the most in interesting attacks usually come from the combination of, of multiple bugs that if they are taken separately, they, will, they, they would seem to have a very low impact, but when you put, put all of them together and you chain them, you end up having uh, a very significant impact uh, and very interesting attacks and the OPC, uh, the OPC uh, filter bugs Benoit I've, I've, I've presented you is very very good example of that. So now uh, now that's that's uh, the end of this presentation. We want to thank our colleagues at Airbus for their, their, their very uh, their support. We want also to thank the vendor because they were very positive about us speaking here at Black Hat and we know it's not always the case. And of course, uh, thank you very much for listening to this presentation and uh, we sincerely hope that uh, you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.